So, so thanks, Nuan. So I'm, I'm basically from the New York office of WSO2. Uh, I really like uh, to come to London because I support the Arsenal Football Club and the stadiums here, right? So I, each time I come to London, I do my uh, pilgrimage of the club, the stadium, and then come back. So, um, so we'll be talking today about crafting an API marketplace uh, strategy, really. And this would really come back to the basics of what a platform business model is. So uh, you, you heard the really good keynotes today, like Tyler spoke about uh, the concept of APIs, events, and streams. And Paul spoke about an interesting area where you have like the biological adaptation and how that ties into technology and how that ties into software. Uh, but there is an underlying theme there. And there's an underlying theme that we see in many of the successful organizations today, many of the successful companies today. Right? So my agenda would be to talk about that underlying theme first, basically talk about what business platforms mean, what API marketplaces mean, and what that really means for an overall business. And this is not just from external API marketplaces. We will try to bring it down to an enterprise uh, level concept as well. Uh, we'll, we'll then talk about going beyond simple API management. Right? So, so there, there are two great talks lined up, which goes into the uh, advanced use cases of API management, uh, the technical details, how it fits into microservices. But uh, my discussion would be a bit more high level. Right? So how you'd go beyond normal, normal API management. And basically, what an enterprise API marketplace means. So, so bringing this whole concept that we know of, like marketplaces, into an organization. So I'll talk about some of the case studies of how some of the large organizations and some of our large uh, customers as well uh, basically employed a successful internal enterprise uh, platform strategy and API marketplace strategy. Right? Okay. So there's been a lot of uh, quotes thrown around. There'll be a lot of quotes uh, thrown around over the next few days as well. Uh, the most famous quote seems to be that software is eating the world, right? Mark and Reason's quote. Uh, this is something that resonated with me. So software alone is not a commodity, right? Uh, so, sorry, software alone is a commodity, right? So it can be replicated, it can be uh, duplicated, you can basically spin up new systems, you can copy platforms. So it's no longer really good to just uh, innovate on a feature side, innovate basically from a licensing perspective, so on and so forth, right? You need to continuously be ahead of the game, right? Uh, and there are some really good examples out there. So, so we spoke about Uber, right? And how Uber basically uses WSO2 as one of its components. Uh, but you know the, the well-known examples of the unicorn businesses that are coming up, right? So the Facebooks of the world, the Ubers of the world, uh, Yabnbs, uh, so on and so forth, right? So all these companies basically achieved like rapid scale uh, innovation, so they basically, uh, they're called the unicorn businesses, right? So if you look at that chart uh, of unicorn businesses, you have a set of organizations that have basically reached the levels of really large organizations within a really short period of time. And one of the core concepts of all these companies is that they are starting to uh, basically engage in a platform business model. So you had a concept of a pipe business model in the past where you have a manufacturing organization, that organization basically creates products, it basically looks at the market for those products, manufactures those products to cater to that market, and then continuously releases those products into the market. And the sole goal is to basically increase that market and make sure that uh, people buy more and more products and you have after-sales service and you have like profitability around that model. But then companies like Uber came up and they didn't have any assets at all. Uh, basically, it was a chicken and egg problem as well because Uber started building a platform and you needed producers for that platform who are the drivers uh, in today's environment. And you needed consumers of that platform who are actually the riders uh, of that environment, right? So on day one, there, there is basically a problem where you launch this platform and, but there is no business because you have no assets, right? It's, it, it's a non-asset model. And you need to make sure that you have enough uh, traction where you promote all these uh, driver or producers to come into the system. But at the same time, you need to also convince that riders need to come into the system, right? So that means you need to have the right level of uh, technology platform. You need the right level of incentives. You really need the right level of marketing, so on and so forth, right? 
So there is a massive chicken and egg problem at the beginning, but that's the model that uh, Uber went with. So a platform, in its simplest sense, is a business, uh, okay? So that's showing something else, right? <laughs> In its simplest sense, it's a business model, right? That facilitates exchange between various parties. So platform really, so uh, there is one, one uh, quote that I would like to quote here. So software is eating the world. Uh, so that's Mark Andreessen's, uh, so who, who is an uh, investment, uh, like an investment professional. Uh, but there is also a, a book from uh, Sandeep Chowdhury, uh, or Sangeet Chowdhury, called The Platform Revolution. So Sangeet basically talks about why the platform is important, why all organizations need to basically adapt a platform business model, either externally or internally. And I'll talk about the internal use case. Right? So in that, Sangeet clarifies that a platform is the technology part that allows these interactions. Right? And then you've got a marketplace, which is basically the buyers and sellers concept. So you bring in the various buyers or the, uh, the consumers, you bring in the various sellers or the producers, and you make sure that they can interact with each other. Right? So, so that's a marketplace. And then you have a concept of an ecosystem. So you go beyond the platform, beyond the marketplace, and you have an ecosystem where there are other concepts or other stakeholders as well. So there are competition, there is competitors, there are the developers of the platform, uh, there is the supply chain who can be uh, people who are other than the producers and the consumers. So there's lots of concepts that basically need to come in. Um, so in, in business school, you would have learned of this word called co-petition. So that's basically competitors also participating in your ecosystem, right, for the better. OK, so, so that brings us to this traditional concept, concept of pipes versus uh, platform business model, right? So in a pipe model, so if you, for example, if you look at the well-known examples, right, I'm not going to go through this list here. But if you look at the well-known examples like, uh, let's say, uh, Britannica Encyclopedia, right, or Encarta. Uh, so that model totally got replaced by Wikipedia, right? So, so the biggest factor there is that Encarta and Britannica, you had a team who f uh, focused on like, producing content, and then you had the buyers who basically consume the content. But then you had companies like Wikipedia coming out, bring, building the platform, and making sure the producers are also part of the ecosystem. Right? So producers produce content, consumers basically uh, take those content and use them. Similarly, another example is Google. Right? So Google basically uh, uses the content that is developed by others. So the Google search engine basically goes through the whole web, uses content that is uh, produced by others, and then make sure that content can be uh, used by consumers, the people who search on the Google search engine. But on top of that, there is also a potential for, for advertisement, advertisement agencies as well, right? So there is a revenue potential there where an advertisement agency can come in, look at the trends that people are searching for, and then specifically produce content to address those trends, right? So it's a platform model where you have the consumers, you have the producers, but then you have additional ecosystems and additional business models coming in as well, right? Uh, YouTube. Another good example, right? So, so basically, you have the broadcast television of today, uh, and, and that broadcast television is rapidly changing, right? So broadcast television is where you just broadcast a set of programs, and people just log in or, or uh, uh, go into the channel and just watch what's going on. That is moving to a more on-demand model where you're broadcasting a specific set of stuff, or you're putting out like series on Netflix, and then users just go in and view them on demand whenever they need. Right. Then you have models like YouTube or Vimeo, for example, where you basically produce, uh, the users produce the content themselves, and then users view the content as well. Right. So one of the things we also see is that uh, basically you're seeing now this marketplace concept materializing a lot. Right. So most of the businesses today are looking towards either a platform model or a marketplace model. So again, interchangeable concepts because platform is just the technology, marketplace is the actual actors in that technology, but there are interchangeable uh, wordings used on the internet, right? So some people call it a business platform, some people call it a marketplace model, but it's, it's all the same concepts. But now you see lots of these platforms coming up. Right? So Tyler mentioned, I think, there's around 600,000 odd SaaS vendors out there. Uh, if you look at the platform models as well, there'll be a large amount of platforms coming out there. 
right? And it is key that each platform innovates in a certain way that, so that you compete. Right? So if, if you take the Uber example, right? Uber is the first to market there, and then Lyft followed, and then you have uh, Grab, and you have uh, so many other, other services around the world, some focusing on regional, uh, some regional focus, but some basically global focus. Uh, so if you need to then uh, compete with Uber, you need to have some kind of other incentive, right? It needs to be a price drop, it needs to be better commission models for the drivers, uh, a tipping model, so on and so forth. So, but you need to innovate then. So Vimeo is a good example there, whereas YouTube focuses on user-generated content and then users as consumers. Vimeo signed up with uh, most of the uh, artists out there and they basically use that as a platform to launch music videos, right, in an official manner, right. So, so there needs to be, since, now since there is a proliferation of platforms around the globe, there needs to be ways of, uh, like, having innovative solutions out there as well, right. So, so that's part one of this story. So platforms are an important concept. Uh, we all understand that. Platforms are important from an external business model as well, as well as an internal perspective. And I'll, I'll talk about that next. Now, how do you build platforms? So you will have a lot of talks during this uh, conference, during the various sessions, as well as the keynotes uh, that spoke about this, uh, where we have, where WSO2 has a technology stack that basically enables you to build platforms. So if you look at the model of APIs, events, and streams, uh, APIs is the one I'm going to focus on, but you have events which would be handled by the, uh, ev the, the analytics engine, you have streams which can be handled by integration and the analytics engine, you have the IoT server product to handle all of this, uh, you have the security aspect that comes into play, so on and so forth. Right? But APIs are the core component if you, if you look at this platform business model. So APIs really mean that you take an internal set of assets and you expose them to either internal stakeholders or external stakeholders. But you are exposing assets to stakeholders in a standardized manner. So I'll, I'll go into some examples here, right? So I'll, I'll focus on one example that's not too well known, right? Uh, so I'm not gonna talk about the Ubers and the Facebooks. So, uh, Dialog Asiata is uh, one of the la is the largest uh, telco operator in the Asia Pacific region. Or I think in the Asia Pacific, one of the largest. Uh, so it has seven uh, subsidiaries or seven companies underneath. And Dialog Asiata. So this looks like a set of blinking lights, but it's a map of the world, by the way. Right? That's the Asian region. This dot here should be Sri Lanka, I guess. So Dialog Asiata is uh, the Sri Lankan telco. Uh, the, the subsidiary of uh, Dialog, uh, the Asiata group, and that's the largest telco in Sri Lanka. So they had a challenge, uh, which is basically that uh, they had a large number of IT teams internally. Uh, so they, they were basically, it's a telco organization, right? So I think, uh, so five, ten years back, the telco organization started facing a big challenge from companies like Skype and Twilio, so over-the-air providers, right? So telcos had to digitally adapt very fast so that they can compete with these uh, application platforms that were coming out on a daily basis. So Dialog had this massive IT infrastructure, they had separate teams, they had uh, more than 1,000 individual services, they had applications being regenerated and redeveloped, there was no analytics across the board, no governance, all the same story of a very large organization, right? Uh, so so the, the CEO of Dialog wanted to basically unify this concept and look at newer business models as well. So what they really moved to was a model where they first had the integration platform on top of all their services, so the uh, WSO2 ESB. Uh, they basically routed all the services through the integration platform, so you had a central platform that can do centralized integration. And then on top of that, they did internal API management. So they, they basically totally re-architected their environment in an iterative manner and ended up with around 500 internal APIs that could be used by the internal teams. Like, of course, they cannot like, just throw away everything and start again, right? It's an enterprise company. So they did this in an iterative manner and started off with 500 APIs. So these APIs could then be consumed by the different teams. And now you can actually see who is using what service uh, how often they're using them. Uh, you can look at the leaderboard of uh, who is using what, so on and so forth. So then the next step was to take these set of APIs and expose them externally as well. 
So, so Dialog came up with an enterprise API marketplace uh, internally, and they took a subset of those APIs, around 10 APIs, and basically exposed them to external partners, stakeholders, enterprises, who could then build applications using those APIs. Right? So for example, Unilever is a multinational organization. Uh, so the Unilever enterprise in Sri Lanka basically built applications using uh, the telco APIs. So you can now send uh, SMSs, you can do location-based services, uh, you can do like operation bi operator billing used, uh, based on those APIs. And then Dialog can have a model of a revenue share uh, system with Unilever where you, you share the revenue. Right? So this then became very successful, and I think uh, today there is a, a large number of API calls per month. Uh, there is a lot of hackathon activities that Dialog does. You go to various agencies, uh, do workshops on how they can build applications around APIs. Uh, Dialog also has a, a venture capital program for newer applications who are using these APIs. Right? So that was very successful as well. I think there is a, a few startups that were formed around these APIs as well. Right? So, but Dialog just doesn't stop with API management. They, they basically continuously have internal workshops. They have continuous external workshops, uh, both internally and externally. Right? So internally, now they have a streamlined process to see exactly who is producing APIs, who is consuming APIs. Externally, you have a really streamlined process where the business can now innovate based on APIs and they can make sure that you, you come up with newer business models around those APIs. So once these APIs are available, you can then start looking at like how do you compete with Twilio, for instance, how do you compete with Skype? Like how do you allow the ecosystem to help you in innovating in that, uh, that region as well? So Dialog then took this strategy to the group as well. So now at a group level, RC at a group level, you have a set of standardized APIs so if someone builds an app in Malaysia that basically uses an SMS API using Malaysia's uh, telecommunication provider, for example, Cellcom, when that user now roams to Sri Lanka, for instance, in, uh, automatically that API will federate and switch to the dialog underlying services because it's now a federated API management model, right? but at a group level. So the telco industry also realized that this is a good concept, uh, the GSMA, the, the uh, telco standardization body, and they have initiatives to have standardized API formats and, and basically a federated model across the globe as well. Right? But that's just one example of the power of a marketplace uh, externally. Right? So we will talk about the business benefits of API management. But the business benefits of a marketplace goes beyond API management, right? So you're looking at governance, you're looking at uh, gamification, which is a terminology which says that you, you basically have, let's say, certain incentives, not just financial incentives, but other incentives to promote internal developers to publish more APIs and services, to consume APIs and services, so on and so forth. Like these can be, re uh, these can be linked to your performance appraisals internally, all of that, right? So Dialog is continuously evolving or innovating in that space, and this API program allows them to do this. So th what does that mean for enterprises? So the story here is that platforms are very important for any organization that needs to stay competitive in a, in a very competitive world, right? In a world of unicorn businesses. But internally, that, that changes your thinking. So instead of actually telling your developers, okay, these are your set of interfaces, now go build this, right? And, and you are this team, you are this team, you are this team, you go build these services, and we'll figure out a way to integrate them. Instead of doing that, with the modern microservices approach, you are looking at autonomous teams who can actually build end-to-end -end services, or end-to-end -end business services that can be consumed by stakeholders, right? So that's, that's the model, like the rest of the days, you'll be talk, we'll be talking about Ballerina, we'll be talking about microservices, but at the end of the day, you are looking at teams that are, who, uh, who are autonomous enough who can build your end services for you, right? So there's no dependencies across the teams. You just build the end services. And that service would most often be an API, which is well documented, which is discoverable, which is uh, showcased on an internal API store uh, where developers and application uh, developers can go and subscribe to those APIs, right? So that's, that's the base concept. If you bring this within an organization, you basically then have the ability to, to make sure that the users continuously create APIs, continuously innovate in that area. 
Once you create an API, you can ensure that there is reusability because application developers can then go and discover those APIs, uh, have a store view of those APIs. They can test the APIs and then they can basically start building applications around those APIs. Right? But at the same time, you have a large amount of data available from this platform as well. Right? You can exactly see the usage of the platform. You can see who is actually producing APIs who is actually going outside that governance model and recreating uh, a service when an API is already there, right? So that there can be a flag for that. Uh, the top API users or the top API publishers, leaderboards for the, uh, the stakeholders, so on and so forth, right? So we have a large number of clients. Uh, so one of the examples is the BNY Mellon Nexon platform that Paul spoke about, where you have an internal ecosystem fronted by API management solutions, where each business unit can have their own API systems and APIs. And then you basically move to uh, an enterprise API marketplace. So that brings me to the, the last slide. Uh, so basically, uh, a reference architecture for an enterprise API marketplace. And I'll, I'll go through this. Uh, oops, okay, I wanted to try that. So there, okay, there is no pointer, but I'll just point out what's happening here. So, you have an enterprise which basically has a set of core services. So there are enterprises where the teams are basically distributed into various business units or organizational units or divisions, or there are enterprises that where you have a flat uh, team structure, right? A smaller, smaller team. So even, and that can be any kind of enterprise. It can be an actual commercial enterprise. It can be a government. It can be various kinds of enterprises. Uh, so we have some of our larger customers who follow a model like this, where each business unit have their own API management solution. Again, the API management solution can be a multi-vendor technology as well. It doesn't just have to be WSO2 API manager, right? It can be something else as well. It can be different, uh, so you can use your different programming technologies, your, your different programming models. One would be like a SOA-based model, one would be a microservices-based model, but at the end of the day, each business unit would have specific APIs that are well documented, standardized, and published at the business unit level. That would then be showcased within an in inter internal enterprise API marketplace. So, so let's say within the business unit, you need to have collaboration, you need to have uh, APIs that are discoverable, so you'd have uh, marketplaces within each business unit. Right? But at the sa same time, you would need an enterprise API marketplace which is in essence a, a developer portal for the whole enterprise where all of these APIs are showcased or published, right? So at that enterprise API marketplace, you should be able to see that these are all the financial APIs in my organization. These are the financial APIs that are available from business unit one versus business unit two. And I should be able to subscribe to those APIs at the enterprise API marketplace. But when I actually consume the API, that should actually go to the API manager at that specific API management system. Right? So there should be rate limiting rules, there should be governance policies at each uh, federated level as well. Right? So that's one model. We of course have many customers who basically combine all of these into a central unit and then you have a central API marketplace as well. So once you have that, then you have the control of figuring out now what APIs should be exposed as an external set of APIs. So if the business then decides, I want to now expose a subset of these APIs to my external stakeholders and basically uh, enable the stakeholders to build applications, I then have the flexibility and control of basically moving some of those APIs externally. Right? So it's, it's not a model where from day one you decide, okay, I'm going to expose all these APIs externally and you start with that big bang approach. Moreover, what we are recommending is an iterative model where you start internally, you start small, you basically control all your APIs internally, and that automatically allows you to make a business decision what APIs you're gonna expose externally. And, and again, there's a large number of customer case studies out there, and we'll be hearing some of them within the coming days. But uh, the, uh, the telco example I mentioned is a good, good use case for exactly this, this model, where you basically first started with internal API management, and then you have external API management. The, uh, so if you go back to that slide, which we, where we'll share the slides, there is the uh, public developer portal URL down there. And on that public portal, I think there's around 60 APIs today that's ex exposed externally. And then internally, there's around 500. It's a large number of APIs, 
But what, to, what you need to remember is this is not an initiative from scratch. You convert existing enterprise assets into APIs. So that becomes 500 APIs, but you still have an API management platform which can now be governed. So that's basically the story today. Uh, so if I summarize, what we basically spoke about is that business platforms are key to digital innovation, especially in the markets we are in today. Right? But one of the things is not every company needs to become an Uber. Right? So every, not every company can start looking at becoming a Facebook from day one. Right? So you have to focus on enterprise business platforms first before focusing on like the whole business platform model. Right? So the enterprise business platforms bring the advantages of a platform business model within your enterprise. And it basically starts giving you lots of advantages, like in terms of creativity, in terms of innovativeness, in terms of governance, uh, and, and the ability to scale vertically, vertically and provide like newer business use cases when the organization is ready for it. Right? So, so which is why it's useful to look at a platform model for internal uh, enterprise use cases as well, and look at enterprise API marketplaces. Right? So the next few talks would go into details on API management, into details on exactly how to uh, carry these out and the actual technical details there. But uh, I hope that was uh, useful. All right, thank you. And we are not having questions now? Later. Later, okay, all right, thank you. <laughs>